there, there's, there's no glue on this joint whatsoever. It's just, it's just squeezed from here. Now you can see this, there's the joint. Hey, I'm Brian Boggs. I've been making chairs, I guess, now for 41 years and made enough of them that occasionally we'll find one get, gets broken. This chair is actually 30 years old and it's doing pretty well. The original seat's intact. Somebody kicked the rear rung out of it. It's cherry, not hard to break. So I don't make this design anymore, partly for this reason. I don't like anything to break and so my new chairs I don't think are going to have any trouble at all. But this is, uh, this is a tricky thing to repair because you've got to put a rung in here and it has to be two and a half inches longer than this space. So it's not possible to get it into this side and then get it into this side because these rungs are tight and glued. I can't spread these legs much at all, just whatever flex I can get here. So the trick for this, and it's a, actually an old traditional trick, would be to make a blank that has a scarf joint in it and turn that to fit, take the scarf joint apart and put it back together. The problem is the way my lathe works is the end pressure from the chuck or from the, uh, the spindle is going to break that, uh, or I'm concerned, it's going to break that scarf joint. So I've come up with a slightly, a slight different variation on that process. I'll show it to you over here. So this is uh, this is a rung. Actually, I'm making for a different chair that belongs to a customer. I'm gonna have to send this with this video and, and show him how to fix it. But what I've got is a is a walnut rung that I've already cut a joint in so that it comes apart like this. And so the pressure from my lathe pushing in is just going to tighten that joint. And then the, at, at a repair time, this will be able to go into one leg. This will be able to angle into the other. I'm going to have to cut this tenon with a taper, and we'll use epoxy on the joint. But I'll be able to pull this together, wrap tape around the center, and turn that relatively safely, move the tape, and finish the turning, or get close to finished on the turning. Now, this is something I just came up with. I've never actually done it. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully this will work. So what I've done to cut this joint is I've made a little sled here for the bandsaw. And I've got the fence set. You can see several trials. And I've also made several um, practice pieces. I'll grab them out of the bin here. Like this, just, in, just to get the process dialed in, never having done this before and also wanting to get the joint centered on the rung and a low enough angle that it locks up well and it will, will glue without showing a glue line. So this fence positions the rung on the sled this fence positions the sled to the table, to the bandsaw, and I'm set now to start my cut right about there. I'll end the cut here where that mark is. Then I'll flip the part over and go again. What I found on the test cuts is that it's a little tricky to hold this dead still without some way attaching it to the fence, but double stick tape proved to work pretty darn well and I can use it for both cuts. Now you're going to need a pretty good bandsaw for this, or at least one that's well tuned, because a bandsaw cut typically put back together glues well, but this piece has to travel forward at least a half inch to close that gap after cutting to pick up the kerf loss. So I'm not exactly lining up the cuts the way they were originally done, so they've got to be good, true, glue joint quality cuts. So I've got my tape here holding the part together. Now I can just focus on even, slow feed pressure 
I'm going to enter this. You'll want a really good sharp bit or a blade. The one I'm using is a new four skip half inch. It's a Morse tool blade. They make a really, really nice blade. Now watch your kerf. When you back out, you want to make sure your kerf hasn't closed up. Tension in the wood will sometimes close this kerf so that when you back out, it can pull your blade off the guide. But this one's nice and relaxed. This is just some uh, popper that we dried. Now I'm going to turn this 180 degrees making sure the end is aligned again here, keeping it against the fence before I press it against the tape, and go again. So this one isn't exactly the same thickness as the walnut one, so my kerfs are not lining up perfectly, or they're not ending exactly the way I want them to. But uh, because they're, it's a double kerf width here, I'd like to have just a single width kerf, but I'm not going to try to flip this over and expect to get exactly the same orientation I had with that first cut. So I'm going to roll with this, pull it back out. This is where the tape is really helpful. It keeps this from moving even though it's completely severed. So as I put these back together, you can see that the, that sharp point of the male part is jamming up against the end. So I'm going to have to cut this back to about here where the thickness of the spear is the thickness of that double kerf, which is going to be about 80 thousandths. That's probably not quite enough, but I'm going to creep up on it. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still got a little bit of gap around there. That's a little better, but I've got the wrong side up. That's still a little bit more gap than I want to see. So I'm going to... Cut a little more off. Now that's going to look pretty good if I can get them evened up. That pulled together will show pretty well. The walnut one shows really well. So the point is down here. You can see that gap there where the point is. But if I tap it, that gap pretty much goes away. It'll be hidden in the finish, in the finished piece quite well. But you can see the glue lines are pretty invisible right there. So let's go to the lathe and see if we can make this work. Actually, what I'm going to do before going to the lathe is I'm going to cut this into an octagon to make it turn a little easier so I don't have to to remove quite so much material uh, with this joint in place. So what I've done to this point uh, after cutting the joint is I pressed it together on the workbench and cut, then cut it to final length. So the final length uh, comp compensates for the material lost 
from, uh, from the curves, basically. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tape this. several times around and it should hold it. There shouldn't be much pulling this apart. The lathe is actually going to help hold it together because of the joint design and the way the lathe works. I'm going to pull this and move this around more than I'm going to on in the cutting process and I'm not getting I'm not getting anything that's it's flexing more than a more than a solid rung would and you can see that joints opening up a little bit right there but I think it'll turn fairly well now I'm not going to be able to turn this to a finish of course because I don't expect that joint you know what I'm going to do I'm going to tape it again right here um, I don't think this joint is going to hold still enough to really make a, a finished surface. I've got a 5 8 wrench which I've dialed in to be the exact dimension of my joint. I'm not pressing very hard with the wrench, I'm just holding it gently against that tenon and it's about to slide over now. There it goes. That's my final dimension. And I'm going to cut that chamfer now while um, I've got this shoulder to rest my tool again. Ordinarily, I would cut this other tenon right now, but I want the stiffness of the full dimension of this end to create a rigidity for safety. And I'm going to just keep my hand right here to keep it from blowing apart. Using my hips, a light cut to prevent problems. You can hear that hissing from that little edge there. Now I'm intentionally working this end first because the drive force, the torque, is coming through this rung, through that joint, and I want all of this body of material down here creating the rigidity I need for good control at this end. In, a, in an intact rung, I don't have to do, worry about that as much. I'll cut this tenon, but still go to finish this end. Now, because this end is closed, I'm going to go for a finish down here. Actually, that's feeling really good. And get rid of that little shoulder. I am out of practice. Okay, now, um, because this is going to have to go in at an angle, remember before I was talking about a tapered tenon, so I'm going to go ahead and taper this down a little bit, even that last eighth inch or so full. But epoxy will fill that and still get a good strong bond. Now I'm going to come down here and chamfer this in, or tend this in.
Now, I'm going to tape it right here now and uh, see if I can turn up to that. Losing this, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be getting involved with this feather edge, so I'm going to have to watch that. I'm not going to use my gouge, which uh, exerts more pressure on the wood as it's cutting. I'm just going to go straight to the skew. Wow, that feels remarkably smooth. One of the things about this cutting technique is that the skew is actually pressing against the wood at the bevel edge. And I cannot see that. Where is that joint? Can't find it. Huh, that's crazy. I think it's there. There it is. There it is right there. But it's not going anywhere. So I'm going to take this tape off. Leave this other one on. And get this section turned. And then I'll tape this. I'm not liking the sound of that. That's better. I had to exert more pressure on the uh, on the wood with the with the uh, bevel of that skew. I don't see that joint. It's not glued. It's just pressed. There it is. Can barely see it, but you see that little. It's a little bit of a fuzz there. Wow. Now, I have never done this technique before, so I'm enjoying this maybe more than you guys are. Okay, now, now that I've moved this around, that joint's showing up a lot more right here. So um, I'm going to push that back and tape that right there. And based on what I'm seeing so far, that's not going to move. This has opened up a little bit here, but I'm going to tape that until it closes. Well, I'm not going to even worry about that. I'm just going to finish it with the skew. Notice I'm going really slow now. I was spinning at 1800 RPMs before, which is my usual turning speed. I'm at 600 now just for safety. Now this is not fast enough to hurt anything, so I'm just going to go ahead and cut that tape right off and get a nice shape here. Wow. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave well enough alone, folks, and uh, quit while while I'm still not hurt. <laughs> but this is I mean this was really feeling very stable on here with that joint captured like that, and. Um, There, there's, there's no glue on this joint whatsoever. It's just, it's just squeezed from here. Now you can see this, there's the joint, but pressed together even just with my fingers like that, it's... So the way this will be glued at assembly time is just wrapping with a ribbon, a nylon ribbon all the way around. Now I've got to cut this. Actually, this one doesn't need to be cut. It's only the second one because this one can go in straight 
and normally, but I'm going to want to make a lighter fit, not the usual. to make it easy to uh, to install and with an epoxy joint this little glue gap won't matter and now this the mortise is an inch and an eighth or inch and a quarter deep this tenon is only an inch and an eighth that last eighth of an inch will be pinched closed so you won't see the glue line this, epo this, this heavy epoxy bond will be all inside this pinched off opening. So there's a there's a, a rung that comes apart. Now I'm gonna mark this so it's easy for the installer to put it together. And um, there you have it. How about that?